Good Life fam. Real, real quick, we got any fresh billionaires in the house? No? Yes? All right. Well, we're, ta- we're talking about the rich fool this morning, and I just wanted to know if we had any new members to the club. All right? So, but, uh, so back when I was in college uh, many years ago, a couple friends and I, we decided to just do something amazing. We, we went skydiving. So uh, anyone else skydiver? And no other sky, a couple skydivers in the house loved it, loved it. And uh, well, I had to do this a long time ago, many years ago, because I was dating Kirsten at the time, and she said, "If we ever get married, you are never doing this." All right. So I went for it when I could. And uh, Kirsten actually went with us though to take pictures, of course. Yeah. And um, we had to take turns when we went because we went up in this little four-seater plane, tiny little plane, which was an, an adventure in and of itself. All right. And so when it was my turn to go up, go up, we hit about 10,000 feet. Uh, we, you know, at 10,000 feet, my instructor, who's atta- attached to my back, we step out onto this little metal bar, hang on to the wing. So I'm flying outside of the plane at this point, which I'm soaking up every second of that. It was amazing. And then three, two, one, countdown, step back into air. We're free falling, exhilarating all around, 5,000 feet, pull the ripcord, and start drifting like a feather. It was incredible. I'm soaking up everything around me in the horizons and so forth. We approach the ground, pull the cables in, boom, touchdown at the bullseye mark perfectly. It was one of the greatest things in my life. And then it was my friend's turn to go up. <laughs> so my, my friend goes up, and we all stay on the ground. We're watching, it. We're watching him, and, and my instructor's on the ground with us watching, watching for him. And we eventually see him coming down. We eventually see him free-falling. And then the chute opens, and then the spinning begins, right? And, and then we're watching, we're watching, and, and the chute's expanded, but not full, all right? It's out, but not full, so they're spinning and spinning. And, spin- and, the, and the instructor who's on the ground with us, is, he just starts saying, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And, and so eventually, we see the chute fly away, and my friend goes back into free fall. All right? Very quickly, the reserve chute opens up, a.k.a. the much smaller chute. All right? And they come skidding in like they're, sl- they're just like flung out of a slingshot, all right? A hundred yards off, top, off, off of the target and just, you know, in a massive bundle of humanity and a pile of dust and dirt and everything. It was quite literally out of control. So we, so we run over, run over and make sure they're okay. I, I finally reach my friend, and, and he, 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 he find, I mean, eyes are like, you can, you've never seen eyes this big or a mouth this wide open. And, and he eventually collects his thoughts, and, and, he, and he goes, I just kept hearing this voice saying, we have a malfunction. We have a malfunction. And I'm thinking, what do you mean, we? What do you mean? What can I do in this moment? Right? And then he said, and then the next thought, he goes, he goes, the next thought through my head was, why did I sign all those waivers? <laughs> what, what was I thinking? Never, ever again. Now, well, it turns out one of, the, one of those steering columns had gotten wrapped around all the other cords, and it was preventing it from actually opening up. And so the, the irony here is that the very thing they thought would give them control actually prevented them from having any control at all. And now, so, so my friend and I, we signed up. We signed up to have the exact same experience, right? We signed up to have the same event go on but had vastly different outcomes, right? For me, a highlight of my life. For him, a horror of his life. For, for me, an exhilaration. For him, a tribulation, right? So, now, we, you know, we had two very different events take place while we were expecting the same thing. And we are, we're going through a series this summer on the, the stories of, of Jesus, parables, right? Parables. And these parables are oftentimes a comparison of two very different ways to go through life, all right? In fact, the word parable comes from the Latin word for compare, all right? So in these stories, 
Jesus is telling us, Jesus is saying, look, everyone wants to go through life one way, right? I'm offering you a different way, a better way, my way, all right? And even my hands, you might even notice my hands are kind of in the shape of a parabola, right? Geometry, anyone? Parabola. It shares the same root word as parable, two different comparison sides, all right? And so, you know, Jesus is saying, my path, my path, it's called the kingdom of God, all right? And so everyone wants their own kingdom. I'm inviting you into mine, right? Because your path, your way, you're not going to like the way it ends. You, you might like your path for a while, but eventually you're going to be afraid and anxious and ultimately worthless, Jesus says. But my way, my way, in my kingdom, no fear, no anxiety, and ultimately immeasurable treasure. Which leads me to the massive question of the day. The big question of the day is, who do you trust really? Who do you trust really? Your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? Right? Who do you trust really? Your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? See, I, I, and I know since we're all here on a Sunday morning, I, the, the answer is obvious, right? Of course, I, I trust God, duh. But that's why I threw the word really in there. Really, who do you trust really? Because to really trust someone means to act as if their words are true. Right? And, and I can't help thinking that maybe one of our biggest needs is for us to see a reality the way Jesus sees reality. And for us to then live a reality the way we say we believe it. Right? And, and we're going to be going through some of Jesus' teachings this morning. And frankly, I'm very glad that these are Jesus' words, right? Because knowing the world is the way it is and that people are the way they are, I would not stand up here and say some of the things that we're going to hear Jesus say. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Because some of it just sounds ridiculous or unrealistic at best, all right? So we're going we're gonna to be in Luke 12 this morning, and... Here's the scene. Luke is kind of echoing a lot of what we've heard in, in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount and, um, you know, you know and, and elsewhere, of course. But basically, he's describing, he's teaching about what it actually looks like to live in the kingdom of God, all right? And by this point of Luke 12, Jesus is attracting crowds, like huge, like massive crowds. Luke actually tells us here in Luke 12 uh, that that there were many thousands of people here, and he uses the word trample. He said people are beginning to trample each other. All right, so packed, packed house, packed crowd, and listen to what Jesus tells this crowd that's trampling each other. Luke 12, 4 is where we start here. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and have nothing more that they can do. Hey, friend. Don't fear somebody who can kill you. Do you see why I'm glad these are Jesus' words and not, my, and not my own? I could not stand up here and say that, right? I mean, if we're, if we're sitting down for coffee or something like that, we're in, at Peaches or whatever, and you lean in, and you're like, Dan, somebody's trying to kill me. They want to kill me. The last thing in the world, I, I mean, I, could, I just could not lean in back into you and say, don't worry about it. What's the worst that could happen, right? But that's what Jesus is teaching us here today, right? That, that actually, it's, he's not just teaching it, though. He's demanding it. It's a demand of Jesus, right? Jesus demands, do not fear those who can kill you, which prompts my second big question of the day. Was Jesus serious? Really? Really? So first big question. Who do you trust really, your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? Second big question here, was Jesus serious? Really? I shouldn't fear someone who could kill me, Jesus? Really? Well, let's keep going and see if maybe we figure out why we don't have to be afraid. 
Check this out. I think this is one of the most beautiful sentences in the Bible, if we let it sink into our bones here, all right? So lock, lock this sentence in your brain. Jesus is teaching uh, about fearing and not fearing and, and, and who we should fear and who we shouldn't fear and so forth. And then he tells us, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Spectacular, right? Spectacular. Jesus is unfolding something spectacular right here when, when we fully grasp what Jesus is talking about here. So do not fear those who could even end your life and kill you. Why? Because you are more valuable than many sparrows. It should thrill you. It should thrill you. Because, because this is huge. This is huge. Because this is not Jesus ranking animal values here, all right? This is Jesus declaring your value. This is not Jesus saying, you know what, all right, well, you got mosquitoes like way down here, right? Mosquitoes, and then you got maybe a, work your way up to a frog, and then you're going to get your way to a sparrow, and I don't know, you probably fall somewhere between a hippo and a lion, I'd say. You're probably right, right? Hey, but you got sparrows beat, so good on you, all right? No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. This is Jesus going back to Genesis 1 at creation, reminding you of who is over everything, all right? And he's saying, you are more valuable because the creator of everything made you in his image. So he's given you and every other person you will ever see dignity and meaning and purpose. Fear that one. That's the only one, in fact, that you need to fear is the one that knows how many hairs are on your head or few hairs are on your head, right? That's the one to fear, only that one, the one who controls your eternity, all right? We have nothing else to fear because we have the God of creation over us, the Holy Spirit in us, regardless of what's happening around us, all right? So, and it's right in the middle of this amazing Jesus declaration of your value, where, where Jesus gets interrupted by a shout from the crowd, all right? Jesus is giving this amazing teaching, and right in the middle of it, we hear from the crowd, hey, tell my brother to give me my money. That's basically what happens here, all right? Now, it's this interruption to the greatest teacher in the world of one of the greatest lessons in the world where, where we get what becomes the launch pad for the parable of the rich fool. Let's take a listen. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21, the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crop. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Okay. All right, we'll pause for a second just to get over the shock that there would ever be a family dispute over money. All right? So, hey. Okay, we'll press through that one. But the, look, Jesus gets thrown this, this random curveball interruption right in the middle of his uh, incredible teaching. And Jesus, like the master teacher that he is, the world's greatest teacher, I could imagine him with that mug on his desk up in heaven, world's greatest teacher, right? And Jesus takes this curveball interruption, and, and he turns it right back around 
to re-emphasize the original point he was trying to make, all right? And so Jesus forces us to think about that big question, who do you trust really, your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? And Jesus leads off with a very strong warning. Take care, watch out, be on guard, because this is not about splitting inheritances. This is not about your brother. This is about you. This is about your heart, not your circumstances here. And this is about greed. And I can just imagine the guy simply like, wait, 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 no, 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 no. I'm not greedy. This is, I'm trying to make, this is about making things fair. This is about making things just. This is about making things right. Jesus looks right out there and says, nope, you're greedy. You're greedy, all right? And so, see, see, greed lies to us. Greed lies to us. Greed will spin our vice into a virtue real quick. Nobody ever sees greed in the mirror, all right? We, we say things like, I'm a great saver. You know, we say, I'm financially cautious and prudent. Or, or we might even say, I earned that. I deserve that, right? See, greed never calls itself greedy. Anger? Oh, you'll know when you're angry, and you'll admit it, right? Uh, you might even boast about it. It was righteous anger, yeah? Or, or lustful? You're going to know when you're lustful, right? But greed? No. No, no, no. That's why Jesus says, watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Because our capacity for self-deception is limitless. Thankfully, Jesus' capacity for grace is limitless as well. Now, so who do you trust really? Your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? Now, I know we think the answer is obvious in this room, but do we act it? Do we act it? We had someone very close to our family uh, come and visit us uh, recently, hang out for an evening, and, uh, and he quite literally, during that, that, that visit for the evening, he quite literally unfolded the plans he had for his life, right? And, and in fact, he told us about the bigger barns. His version of the bigger barns were set. They were established. And, 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 he, and, and he bragged about the fact that he had, just like what we just heard, he had many years prepared to relax, eat, drink, and literally be merry. He was set. He was set. And then his wife died. It's tra a tragic Tragic story, for real. Very sad. But the most fascinating thing was that we heard this statement. I heard this statement said throughout the evening, repeatedly, and, and, and seriously, he, uh, he must have uttered this phrase six or eight times over the course of about three or so hours of, of hanging out. He would just, out of the blue, he would just look at someone and say, this was not the plan. This was not the plan. This, this was not the plan. Tragically, very sadly, he trusted the wrong plan. But it does not have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. And Jesus tells us at the very end of this parable, it will be like that for those who store up treasures for themselves. He says it will be like that. But it doesn't have to be like that. So how can it be different? How can it be different? Jesus tells us with the final words of the parable, be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. Now, what in the world does that mean? It, it means to make God your greatest treasure, to, to make God the thing that you value most, to make, to make his love and his strength and his grace and his purpose and his plans what you want more than anything in the world. And we have a word for all of that being rich toward God. We call that worship. Worship. See, when our whole life is an act of worship towards God, our whole life and everything in it, we don't have to be worried about anything in our life. We don't have to be anxious about anything in our life when our whole life is an act of worship 
toward God. And Jesus tells us, in the, he says this in the immediate verse right after the parable to reemphasize again his original point. And again, Jesus is going to say something. We're going to hear Jesus say something that I would not stand up here and tell you. I would not say this. But check out what Jesus says. He says, therefore, therefore what, Jesus? Therefore what? Therefore, for everyone who is rich toward God, for everyone who is rich toward God, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. So, right before the parable, Jesus is saying, don't fear anybody who can kill you. Right after the parable, Jesus is saying, Don't be anxious about what you'll eat or even what you'll wear, right? This is a massive spectrum of things to not worry about, huge spectrum. Everything that Jesus is telling us, don't worry about everything from lunch to murder, right? So uh, I think Jesus is telling us to not be anxious about anything at all, ever, which goes back to the second big question. Was Jesus serious? Really? And my answer to that is yes. Yes, yes, yes. I think Jesus was very serious. Very, very serious. 125 times in different iterations, Jesus tells us, do not fear. It's all over the Gospels. And I think that Jesus thinks we have a major problem with fear and anxiousness and worries about the what abouts, and the what ifs, and what what about, and what if. And, and, all right, and so if Jesus thinks we have this massive problem, what do we do then? What do we do about it, right? Because we can't just walk around saying, do not fear, do not fear, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. It doesn't work, right? We can't, that doesn't, that does not work to just do that. I mean, if I told you, don't think about pink polar bears. If you, th- if you think about pink polar bears, it will ruin your life. It will sap all the joy of your life, and you will be in utter despair if you think about pink polar bears. What are you, you going to do? You're going to be consumed with the idea of thinking about not thinking about pink polar bears, right? That's what fear and anxiety do. So Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us right here, what to do instead. What to do instead. Check this out. Your father knows all that you need. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Don't seek the bigger barn. Seek his kingdom and your father will provide everything that you need. Do you believe that? Do you trust him? Really, really. I hope you do. Because it is the only way. It's the only way that we will not fear and not be anxious. Right? Every other bigger barn, every other kingdom, we will, we will seek our will, not his. Our plans, not his. We will seek our glory, not his. And the result will be fear and anxiety. Seek the kingdom of wealth. You'll be anxious about the account balance. Seek the kingdom of health. You'll be anxious about the lab results. Seek the kingdom of politics. You'll be anxious about the election. Seek the kingdom of academics. You'll be anxious about the exam. Seek the kingdom of career. You'll be anxious about the promotion. Seek the kingdom of acceptance. You'll be anxious about people pleasing. It's only, it is only in the kingdom of God where we can know that our God will provide us whatever we need whenever we need it, to honor him and live his will. Completely anxiety-free, even if it's on our very last breath. My youngest daughter, Summer, she has this uh, a Maverick City t-shirt. And any Mav, Mav City fans in the house? All right, couple, couple. You need to get yourself some Mav City in your life, I'm telling you. All right, so the, 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 this, this t-shirt, this t-shirt says, It's a miracle we can breathe. It's a miracle we can breathe. And I love it because it's true. God is in control of the very hours of our day and the very breath in our lungs. And when we see it all, when we see it all as grace and gift from him, 
then we can live in faith, not fear. Do you trust him really? Do you trust him really? Because it's an invitation to a life that only Jesus makes possible. But what does it look like, though? What does that look like in real life, this this life in the kingdom, this seeking the kingdom? What does it look like in, in, in real life? Well, all right, we're going to go through, you know, four quick, quick ways, four quick ways to not be the rich fool, all right? What, how, how can we not be the rich fool? How can we not seek the bigger barns, all right? First, expect suffering. Ex- Woohoo! All right, ready? Sign me up. Sign me up. Expect suffering. All right, stick with me, though. Stick with me, all right? Remember, what did the rich fool really want? The rich fool wanted to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds pretty sweet. (laughs) That that sounds almost like the American dream, right? You could substitute that phrase. But the fact is, every book in the New Testament assures us of suffering. It's going to happen. Jesus even says to us, In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I've overcome the world, right? See, we can't celebrate the work of Jesus while despising the way of Jesus, right? We can't celebrate the work of Jesus while despising the way of Jesus. The work of Jesus was the forgiveness of sin, the defeat of Satan, the reconciliation with the Father, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the triumph over death, and life everlasting in the kingdom of God beginning today, now and forever, amen, yes, yes, we celebrate that. We celebrate all of that. We love all of that. But all of that work of Jesus was accomplished through the way of Jesus, the way of the cross, the way of the cross. Now, and Jesus, Jesus, Paul, all the apostles, all the apostles, they understood that the Christian life was a call to share in the sufferings of Christ, not run from, not escape from, to share in. Dallas Willard says it like this, all right? It is absolutely essential to our growth and to the mind of Jesus that we accept the trials of ordinary existence as a place where we experience and find the reign of God with us as an actual reality. We are to see every event as an occasion in which the competence and faithfulness of God will be confirmed to us. These are beautiful, beautiful words. But it's a reality that very few of us accept and realize and know. And, 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 and understand this, though, too. Understand this. Don't misinterpret this. Understand that this is not some kind of martyrdom here. Right? This is not a seeking of suffering. This is an expecting of suffering, right? And then we allow God to redeem us, right? Now, the second way to not be the rich fool, all right? Exchange your stuff for God's stories. Exchange your stuff for God's stories. The rich fool had one concern, himself, himself. And it's amazing. He uses the word I or my 11 times in three sentences. It's quite the linguistic feat if you think about it, actually, right? But he was an astoundingly self-obsessed man, right? My crops, my barns, right? But no consideration for God or, or others, which makes perfect sense in the kingdom of man. But it's in this teaching right here, what Jesus tells us, Jesus says to us, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Pretty sweet offer God has for us right there, honestly. You know, trade your finite stuff for God's infinite stuff, right? Look, any time that you have the opportunity to trade your stuff for God's stories, do it. You will never, ever regret it, even if it's in eternity, all right? So, but have you, quick question, might be a dumb question, I think it is. Have you ever spent money and regretted it? I, probably this week, maybe on the way in this morning, all right? Yeah, we do that all the time, right? Listen, listen. You want fewer regrets in life? Give your money away. Give your money away. 
even if it's just for the eternal reward, even if it's just for the treasures in heaven. Jesus told us to do that about 40 times. Look, if you have no other reason, just give it away for the eternal reward. Go for it. Run with that. Do it. Do it. Do it. Because, in fact, Jesus saw the, the primary competitor to our walk with God as money. Je- Jesus, Jesus said, in this world, he said, you can't serve two masters, God and money. Now, we might expect him to say God and Satan or God and the devil. He says God and money. It was money. Our possessions are the risk to us, all right? So think about this. A couple questions. Do you have anything that you value more than anyone? Be careful, Jesus says. Be careful because no thing you have is made in the image of God. Okay? Do you have anything that you wouldn't even let someone use? You know, Jesus was a, 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 a carpenter for a lot longer than he was a preacher. And I bet Jesus had some neighbors borrow some tools of his and never return them, right? (laughs) Do you have anything that someone feels like they need to compete with for your time and intention? I got my first car when I was in college, and I loved that car. I could finally, 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 I could go wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and crank the music as loud as I wanted. All right? Love that car. Well, one day, when Kirsten and I were dating, and, and I had to grab some gas, and, and while I was getting some gas, Kirsten goes in and gets a big gulp, right? And so I finished the gas. As I'm pulling away, I'm looking over my shoulder. I don't notice that, I don't notice that the, the big gulp is in the middle of the dash, right? Soon as I move, boom, big gulp over, all over the dash, even down into my precious tape deck there, right? It was feline reflexes jump into, into, into action. I grab the cup, and I'm holding it above the dash. There's about a third of the cup left here, right? About a third of the cup left. And I look to Kirsten. She's frozen. And I look at the cup, and I look at Kirsten, and I look at the cup, and I look at Kirsten, and I tip the cup up and pour the rest of it all over the dash. Now, might seem like, a, I don't know, some sort of funny little story, cute little story, but I'm telling you, Kirsten recalls it as the moment she knew she loved me. Now, see, when people know that they are more valuable than your stuff, powerful things can happen. Powerful things can happen. So ever since, we, we have just tried to make a, a point, however imperfectly we have, for sure, no doubt, but just tried to make sure that, that, that something was never more valuable to us than someone, right? And, and in fact, the, the house that we live in right now, a story for another time, longer story there, but we, we, the house that we live in right now was actually because we were looking for a place uh, where a, a Haitian refugee could stay with us who ultimately became like family, right? So, so listen, Turn your stuff into God's story. You you will never, ever regret it, I assure you. Now, third thing, third thing to not be like the rich fool. Exchange fear of your loss for faith in God's promises. The rich fool had bigger barn syndrome. he, He wanted to be king of his kingdom, but he lost it all anyway, right? His fear of his loss did not prevent his loss, right? He lost it all anyway. So it's so, so important for us to exchange fear for faith because it's impossible to love your neighbor when you're afraid, right? So, but to exchange fear of your loss for faith in God's promises, we have to actually know God's promises, all right? So do yourself a favor, all right? Memorize the promises of God. Memorize the promises of God. And I'm telling you, It'll be even, we hear a lot about quiet times in the Christian life, right? Quiet times. Have your, did you do your quiet time? Did you do your, have a quiet time? No, no. Memorize the promises of God. It'll be even better than a quiet time, honestly, because when you have the promises of God readily available to you anytime, anywhere, any place, your whole life can be like a quiet time. 
And Jesus gives us what might be one of my favorite promise right here in this teaching, all right? So let's memorize this one here right now. It's an easy one, but so packed. Check this out. Jesus tells us, fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, all right? Let that one soak in and haunt you, all right? Fear not, he says. Fear not, he leads off with. So let fear and anxiety and worry literally be a trigger. Okay, what was that promise again? All right, what was the promise? What was the promise? What was the promise? Listen to all of these promises, all right? Little flock, little flock, he says. You're part of his flock. The Lord is your shepherd. And when the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. You will lack for nothing, for nothing. It's your father's good pleasure to give. You're a child of the living God, right? And it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, right? Your father is also king, king, all right? He is sovereign and has power over all, and he gives us the kingdom today and forever, right? And our shepherd, our father, our king, he's also happy about it. He's happy about it. It pleases him to give us our kingdom life. If we actually have faith in that promise, a life without fear becomes our reality. We sang those words this morning. They were words from all of us who were moving our lips this morning. We sang those words. Is it real to you? Do you act like it out there? Is it real? Do you trust him? Really? And lastly, fourth final way to not be the rich fool, experience life with God. So to avoid being the rich fool, all right, avoid being the rich. We're going to expect suffering. We're going to exchange your stuff for God's stories. We're going to, we're going to, to, to uh, you know, ex- ex- exchange fear of your loss for faith in God's promises. And finally, we are going to experience life with God. The rich fool had no desire for the presence of God, right? The rich fool trusted his plans for his life, and his soul was required of him right then and there, right? The rich fool spent eternity without God, right? The bedrock, the bedrock for a life free of fear, and free of anxiety is not the bigger barns of your dreams, whatever version of those bigger barns are, right? The bedrock of a life without fear and anxiety is a life fully confident in the presence of God, right? As the psalmist says, I will fear no evil. Why? I will fear no evil even if I'm in the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Under under every seemingly unrealistic or ridiculous statement of, of Jesus saying, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. We actually have the whisper of God saying, because I'm with you, because I'm with you, because I'm with you. It's the entire story of God from beginning to end from Genesis to Revelation. It's God's charge to to Abraham. It's God's charge to Moses and Joshua and David. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And Jesus is introduced to the world as Emmanuel, God with us. And and Jesus' final words, when, when he's sending us out into the world, his final words are, remember, I'm with you until the end, right? And then in the very end, on the very last page of Revelation, We hear these words when all is made perfect with the entire creation. We hear these words, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. So then, who are you going to trust really? Your plans for your life or God's plans for eternal life? You know, my my skydiving friend, My skydiving friend, he had someone attached to him telling him, we have a malfunction. We have a malfunction. We have a malfunction. 
Well, we, in our Christian life, we also have someone attached to us, the Holy Spirit. And he's telling us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm in, I'm in control. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm in control. I'm with you. And so now, with that reality, if we live in that reality, we can live our lives free of fear and free to live richly towards God in his kingdom rather than be a rich fool in our own because he is our shepherd, he is our father, he is our king, and he is with us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are all of those things and then some. I thank you for your presence. Thank you for gathering us here this morning. Thank you for the gift that it is to actually be together. I pray, God, that we, that we embrace what you have for us, that we embrace you, that we know that it is not wishful thinking. We know that is not a Hallmark card, that we know that it is real, that you are real in our lives. And when we forget, you give us to each other. Help us to be a people that remind each other of your promises to not live in faith, or not live in fear, but to live in faith. Help us to not be the rich fool seeking his own kingdom. In Jesus' name.